So I'm going to introduce you to a lady who is from um, Ireland, Vera Toomey. Are you there, Vera? There you are. And um, Vera and I were chatting, and um, we met on by a friend um, who connected me from Melbourne with, with Vera, who has a very special book to share. Some of you may know her already, because I believe that a lot of you have heard her story. I know that Lorraine did, and things like that, I've read her story. So it's very important that this message gets out, and I've seen this as a beautiful platform for our Australian audiences and New Zealand and to, to hear this story and to bring this story into um, Australia. Come ahead, Vera. Thanks for the lovely introduction, Karen. Oh, yeah. um, and um, I'm delighted to be invited here today. Um, it's uh, I was excited about being here, you know, to, to, to meet you all and to um, um, get an opportunity to, to especially talk to people from Australia about um, uh, the, the, this issue, I suppose, because there's a lot of action going on in Australia at the moment for people that are fighting for access to medical cannabis and that's what we have been um, fighting for here for our daughter Ava and for other people over the last, well publicly over the last five years but uh, we've been we've been working hard to keep our little girl Ava with us for the last nine and a half years because she's she's going to be she's going to be ten in November and um, <coughs> sorry, no, the reason I kind of just tear up a little bit about that is because our little girl was diagnosed at four months of age with a condition called Dravet syndrome. It is a chronic, intractable, <coughs> drug resistant form of epilepsy. And when we were inside with the consultant, the consultant uh, it greeted us. Um, it was always a a, a memorable experience, um, I'll put it that way, to meet with her. And on the occasion that we met with her, she told us that my four month old child would never walk, she would never talk, she would be in a wheelchair, and uh, that we should uh, look into the, the, the reality of residential care for Ava for the rest of her life, and that we should accept and prepare for that eventuality. And at that time, I said, I said no. And I, I believe that what has happened for us, that that woman that day lit a fire in me because I had been given a list of all the things that my daughter would not achieve. Nothing about the possibility of, with hard work and determination, what we could do for our child. Um, but of all the negativity and everything that she wasn't going to, uh, to um, where she wasn't going to get to. Now, she did have continuous seizures. She did have a very, very difficult time for a number of years and we graduated through each one of the pharmaceutical medications. And I'm not opposed to pharmaceutical medications by any manner of means if they're effective and if there are no side effects that are detrimental to the patient, that's fantastic. But that isn't what happened for our family. And Ava went through two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve different forms of anti-epileptic medication and all of them failed. Uh, some of them worked for a little time, but her seizures broke back through every single time. So um, I had an amusing conversation with two ladies earlier, um, one from uh, America and one from Australia. And uh, I was saying uh, the Americans were doing great and the Australians are fighting on over to get access to the medical campus. <coughs> because it was in, to, the, to America we were looking. Um, in America, progress had been made. I saw a beautiful little girl called Charlotte, Charlotte Figgy. Um, and she was just around the same age as my daughter Ava, and she had Dravet syndrome, and she was she was absolutely thriving. She she was riding a bike, 
and the reason that she was doing this was because of medical cannabis. And so I decided, um, very sensibly, I thought, that uh, Ava needs access to this as well. And I thought it was quite, quite reasonable. I thought, um, I, 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 it, it's, it's, I, I can't get it via the consultant. We tried. I'll, I'll try something different. I, I'll try to get in contact with Simon Harris, the Minister for Health. I'll try and speak to him. In fact, actually, Leah Varadkar, who is the Taoiseach now, was the Prime, or the Prime Minister, says I was the Taoiseach of the country when uh, we started campaigning and trying to contact for Ava. Um, try to get onto him, no reply. Try to get onto Simon, no reply. Uh, emails. I spent days and nights and days and nights emailing, phoning, emailing, phoning, trying to get onto the air and trying to get onto the politicians. And every day, and Ava continued to seize. And we had to get the medication. And Ava's life um, involved seizures hospital admissions, come back out of hospital, seizures, hospital admissions, come back out of hospital. Um, we would have spent about four and a half months of every year inside in hospital with my daughter, um, because solely because of her seizures. But now, today, as I'm speaking to you here now, as we enter October, my daughter is three years without a hospital admission in an emergency to the CUH because of the introduction of medical cannabis in her life. This is medical cannabis. <laughs> this little bottle contains medical cannabis. Now, I have a license for this medical cannabis. There are only 21 other patients in this country that have access to medical cannabis under a license. Simon Harris has introduced a program um, under the Compassionate Access Program, he calls it, but he forgot to do something. He forgot to attach a product to the Compassionate Access Program so that people could apply for a license for a product. So that needs to be fixed too. But we fix that as well. And in the meantime, I decided anyway that uh, there was no possible way that I could write a book. There wasn't a hope that I could. My friend Brian, had continued to say to me, Vera, you've got to write it down. You've got to write it down. You've just got, to. and I just, I just said, man, I can't do it. I can write a Facebook post, but you're serious. I can't write a book, I can't, you know? And we persist, he just kept on and on. And eventually I said, okay, I'm going to try. And we took, we took a lot of the, uh, my whole life for the last um, five years, has been chronicled on Facebook. <laughs> um, I'm not a public person at all, but um, for Ava, which is the name of the book, we had to do it publicly. Unfortunately, in this country, my, um, my discovery has been that the only way to get anything done by politicians in this country is to shame them into it. So that's what we did, we shamed them into it. Um, it, it, it is effective, but it is not what anybody wants to be doing to be out there talking about their public, in public, about their personal lives, about their daughter's condition. People should have access to this medication um, without having to go to the lengths that we went to. I have spoken regarding the medical cannabis um, above in Dalier and obviously all around the country, up here in Northern Ireland. I've spoken about it over in the European Parliament, over in the House of Commons. Um, and still they don't have it done right here for us in either the Republic or in Northern Ireland and, and that really has to be fixed very, very soon. Um, if I have time, have I time? Yes. Yeah, I, I just, um, I, I, I said I'd tr try and maybe read a small bit out of the book, you know, for you, but I didn't want to launch into it without <coughs> explaining to you that Ava's really well and Ava's going to school Ava's, I don't really get like this, but this Australian connection is making me nervous. <laughs> um, but uh, Ava's been at school every day that she was supposed to be in September. Every day. And she's got a cold at the moment, right? But because of this, 
cause my biggest problem. And previously, my biggest problem was how much brain damage, 25 seizures in a day was after talking to my daughter. And the thing is that that reality has been removed. And now she is an independent, oh my dears, feisty little devil. She's funny and she's determined and we're so proud of her, you know? But I thought what I might do um, is I just might read a small bit of it just to show you what life was like. And while you're, you know, I, I hope I'm not going on too long now, while you're listening to this, just, just remember that she's, she's well and she's going to school and she's having fun. And I have three other children. I have Ava's nine, I have Sophia eight, Michael is seven, and then Vera May is four and a half. So they're engaging with each other and they're having the best, the best time. Um, but this is the, the prologue to the, to the book. Um, we, gave the, we gave the chapters all a little tightly, you know, just to kind of set it off. But this is my, this is the only book I've ever written now, by the way, as well. <laughs> so I don't have any, um, I don't have any beautiful bookmarks or anything like that, but we've got the book and we've got our story, so this is, this is part of it. Um, I know. It was early in 2016, so, oh no, it's a normal day. I have a sadness in me, I have anger in me, I have heartbreak in me. It was early in 2016, and just a normal day, or as normal as it ever gets when one of your children suffers from a serious chronic illness. Ava's epilepsy had long since taken over our lives. Every waking moment was consumed by it. I operated under constant fear and tension, waiting for the next seizure. It was coming, though you never knew when. But as sure as day it was coming, we had reached a stage when Ava was having several seizures almost every day with over 20 on a bad day. They may have varied in extent and severity, but each one was an agonizing experience full of pain and terror. I was in the kitchen that day, doing the washing and chatting away with my mother, Catty. The door between the kitchen and the sitting room was open, so I'd occasionally snatch a glance at the children playing to see that they were okay. You know yourself when it's quiet, it's usually time to investigate what they're up to. The constant illness uh, had sapped the strength from my six-year-old daughter, Ava, and she'd been out of sorts for the last few days with another ear infection that raised her temperature, along with other alarm bells for an impending seizure like how our previous night's sleep had been, which was disturbed. The family needed to be vigilant and being sleep deprived had become part of daily life as we monitored Ava through the night for seizure activity. Bang! A cry of distress came from the sitting room. I rushed in with my mother following right behind. Ava was lying on the sofa, her torso stiff as a poker and her arms and legs jerked uncontrollably. She had a fixed, far off look in her eyes. She wasn't in the room anymore, the seizure had her. I needed to control my worry and, to be honest, keep myself from panicking. You go into automatic pilot mode when a seizure strikes. You tell yourself, keep calm. You know what needs to be done. Just do it. While my mother stayed with Ava, I ran back into the kitchen, reaching up, and I got the rescue medication buckling from its appointed place high up in the press. It's powerful stuff not to be used lightly. It may stop a seizure, though not always, but either way, it would leave Ava zonked for several hours afterwards. No, it wasn't to be used lightly at all. Still, it was all that was available. My mother taught me 20 seconds, Vera, as I hurried back into the sitting room. We still had time. It might stop of its own accord. You were to wait five minutes before administering the rescue medication, so it was agonising, waiting, kneeling beside Ava, praying for it to stop. After five minutes, she exclaimed, Vera, it's not stopping. She was right, if anything, the seizure was growing in intensity with more powerful muscle spasms and it was time so to, to get, it was, it was time. So I gave Ava the medicine, hoping it would halt the attack. Afterwards, I looked up at my mother, what do you think, is it easing off at all? She looked down at me with a pained expression, no, Vera, she's not coming out of it, I think it's nearly time to phone for the ambulance. You needed to wait to see if the rescue medication would work before the next step, the emergency ambulance call, but my mother was right, we were at that stage now, I made the call. Whoever answered the phone at the other end recognised the number. Hello, Vera, is that you? Is Ava having a seizure again? How long? Okay, we're on our way. The call-outs were so regular at this stage. 
that there was no need to provide our address, they knew where we were. I had a short, a few short moments to phone my husband, who was at work with the, with the news and try to organise things for my mother who would mind the rest of the kids. I also rushed to put some essentials into a bag for the looming hospital stay. The ambulance arrived from a crewman in less than 15 minutes. Ava was still seizing. Working quickly, we were, we were well used to the procedure by now. She was gently lifted into the ambulance and off we sped. About 20 minutes later, we arrived in Cork City into the Cork University Hospital. How thoroughly sick of that room I was. Some of the most upsetting, distressing moments of my life had taken place there. The doctors and the nurses surrounded Ava trying to stop the attack. How about if we try phenotone, suggested a junior doctor. Doctor, I said, that takes half an hour to have an effect. I've been through this process so many times before. Yes, oh yes, that's right, Mrs. Toomey, it does. Have you experienced this before? Yes, I have too many times and that one isn't suitable. It never worked quickly enough for Ava. While this discussion was going on, the seizure stopped, just like that, as suddenly as it had begun. It had lasted 40 minutes from beginning to end. It had been a bad one, powerful, another shocking day, but far from the worst. Ava looked wrecked and completely exhausted, lying in the hospital bed. As I gently held her hand and stroked her hair, trying to give her some comfort from the pain, or at least let her know she wasn't alone, I wondered to myself, how did my family end up in such a terrible predicament? Much more importantly and more urgently, I strove to think of a way to alleviate her suffering and give her a chance at a better, healthier life. As I held her hand, I silently assured her, Ava, darling, I promise we're going to make it happen. That's the start. She's coming to get me. No, no. There's, <laughs> there's, there's, there's one thing. There's a lot of young girls here, you know, today. And uh, that, 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 that other lady was talking about the, the Magdalene laundries there, you know. I, I, I just, it's about, you know, about the courage and about back the things that you have to do, you know. And when I, you know, I've read a good few books myself. I never expected that I'd write one, but I, I, um, I thought I wanted to write something at the start of it that kind of, you know, encapsulated the, 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 the this, this is what I came up with because I've learned more about life in the last nine and a half years than I learned in the previous thirty. That's been my experience. My daughter has taught me more about myself and about people, all, not only in Ireland, but all over the world that have supported us. Um, we had to walk to Dublin. Um, I don't know if some of you are aware of this. I walked to Dublin from my home in Cork, which is 250 odd miles or something, I don't know. It took us nine days to do it because they drove us to that. They, they wouldn't help us and I wouldn't take no for an answer. So I said, if Simon Harris won't meet me, I'll walk up and meet him. And that's what we did. And on the way up, it started off as dozens of people and then it turned into hundreds of people. And by the time we got to Dublin, there was thousands there, even though the, the broadcasting services wouldn't say that. But there was over 3,000 people outside the gates of the Dáil when we arrived in Dublin that evening. So my, my thing was the, the, the fear, the fear about what will Johnny down the road think? What will Auntie Mary say if I'm going looking for medical cannabis? What will they say below at the shop? Will they come out a mess? What are they going, they're going to be talking about me? Oh my God. Well, anyway, after a period of time, I got rid of that. So this is my, this is my thing. I maintain the greatest achievement in life is to lose fear. When you are no longer afraid, you are free. And once that happens, you will achieve any goal in time with focus and determination. So I'd like to say that to you girls, that no matter, no matter who it is, no matter what it is, you can do it. If you decide that you're going to do it, you can. And it doesn't matter how many people ever discuss with you that you can't do it. Push it away to the back of your mind, away to the side, and do what you want to do. 
because they told me that I was crazy. They told me that it could never happen, but it's going to happen. And there's a compassionate access program and there's enough people now to bring it in to Ireland. And I'm so proud that my Eva is part of that. So just remember, have the courage of your convictions, you know?